Hi everyone, welcome to uh, the live question and answer session for session nine on day three of the International Online Exarch Conference. Uh, so welcome, first of all, all the speakers. Thank you so much for a range of really interesting talks. We have so many questions from people already. We will start with uh, Tammy. You mentioned that ochre is used to tan hides. Could you briefly explain uh, where, when and how? Cool. Um, yeah, so in terms of the Middle Stone Age archaeology, we don't actually have evidence of the hides. They haven't preserved. But we have evidence of how the ochre was used and that it looks like from experimental use of ochre pieces, modern experimental use of it, we um, rubbing it against uh, even human skin or hide or hair, it gets a kind of rubbed, you know, a lot of the ochre is quite hard, some of it is really soft, but you get a really nice shine or polish or micro striations that form on the top of the pieces. And so from that, it's, it's quite tricky to know whether maybe people were just handling the ochre and you get it from, from just handling it. But you also get it from, uh, you, it's likely that it would have been something a little bit more forceful, that they're rubbing it quite hard against hide. And ochre actually helps to stop, the, the iron oxide in the ochre actually helps stop the decay process. So it can actually help preserve hides and um, make a really nice hide, just the process of, of either putting ochre powder on it, but perhaps in the past they were rubbing ochre directly, the pieces directly, to a, a kind of a dual purpose of scraping the hide at the same time to remove some fat, but putting ochre on it to preserve it. Okay, and is this something that still continues in the present day as well? Yes, yeah, so there's been cases um, in, in various communities um, and cultures around around Africa that they, they still use ochre as a, as a good um, hide um, thing to stop the, the decay process, um, kind of a preservative. Um, but yeah, but not, not, I mean, there's other, there's other methods now that, that work a little bit better, but it seems like also some of the experiments that were done by Rian Rifkin, he found that the, the red ochres that often have a slightly higher, well, will have a higher iron oxide content, they will actually stop the decay process better than the yellow ochres. And so it might be some reason that Red ochres generally in, in ethnographic cultures and modern cultures and in the past, it seems that red ochres were just preferably used. They were just preferred for some reason. And it might just it might have been the iron and it might have been the color. Cool. Thank you. As someone with red hair, I can definitely understand it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Cool. Uh, our next question is for Victoria. In what position did you put the bone flakes, sorry, in the sediments? Uh, flat, distal side up, etc. cetera? Um, so I kind of just placed them in. Um, I put them around in the hole. Uh, there's a 50 by 50 uh, centimeter block that I made. And um, some of them were distal side up, some of them were flat, some of them were, it was kind of just randomly placed. Thank you. Um, and we have another question here for you. Are you planning to do uh, more research? And if so, will you use a higher resolution microscope next time? So yes, um, I'm actually busy doing some more research currently. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm using the information that I found in this paper to study some bones um, from Classy's River in South Africa. Um, and we're trying to get access to a, a really high resolution microscope. Um, it just depends on all the COVID rules and everything currently. Did you, by the way, already publish the results uh, of this? Uh, it's not published in anything as of yet. I'm hoping to maybe get it because it's, it's an honours research paper. So I'm not sure what's, what's, who's looking for something like this. Um, I'm speaking to my supervisor to try and get it published. Okay. Well, it sounds like uh, someone at least is interested in finding out more because they asked what the name of the paper was. So uh, definitely, uh, hopefully, if anyone's interested, I'm sure they can contact Victoria for more information. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, our next question is for Fergus. The variable you didn't mention was thickness of roofing materials. It is often said that buildings are thatched to modern standards, which are thick and make it difficult for smoke to penetrate, thus making the interiors very smoky and in houses open to the public, creating a considerable health issue. Um, it also impacts the amount of material used, weight of the roof and cost. Is this something you might add to your project at a later date 
or have you are you happy that over the years of building at Butzer you've already found the perfect thickness? Uh, I certainly wouldn't be so bold as to claim we found the perfect thickness, but we do find a fairly thin coating works best because it does let the smoke percolate out. Um, in modern thatching, it's quite common to uh, leave the previous coat on there sometimes as a, an undercoat and thatch on top, and we certainly don't tend to do that. Um, so yes, I, th I think we've found something we're reasonably happy with, a fairly thin coating that holds together but does allow the smoke to um, escape. So I didn't mention that, but yes, that is a very important factor. Okay, thank you. I have, I'm not sure if uh, you're also the person to ask about this, it's aimed at Trevor as well. Uh, so maybe you can both answer. Um, absolutely fantastic project. Um, in terms of earth walls, so Trevor, will you use different techniques on different parts of the wall for, uh, or for each wall panel between uh, posts to find out which would work best? Um, the speaker is uh, thinking about earth and cob bricks raw, for example, that seem to have been discovered in early Iron Age contexts in northern France and that are never used or presented uh, anywhere. And they also add, I simply can't wait to see how your project evolves. Thank you for sharing. Um, thanks for the question. It's, it's really good. And it's actually a point of discussion. At the moment, we're thinking of, of doing a, a cob wall, so a, a sort of rammed earth wall in which we'll just use a, a, a soil which will be bound with uh, probably some sort of organic material like grass. Um, and I have been wondering whether we should do different sections of the wall in slightly different materials. One of the limitations we have is that the soil um, that we're on is, is a very thin, it's probably a sort of uh, glacial lowest soil, so it doesn't lend itself to a lot of uses. So I, I think that this, this sort of compacting technique is probably the one we'll go for, but great question. And, and we are discussing whether we might do some subtle variations on that. Okay, thank you very much. I have a question for Basma here. Have you done or are you planning to do uh, useware comparisons between the experimental and the archaeological amphora? Yes, I intend to do that, inshallah, because in my research, uh, I started a comparison between the style of amphora which made in uh, old Roma, old Roman provenance, and uh, how does the mm. Egyptians uh, 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 trying to do the same uh, shape of the amphora. Okay, I'm actually I'm not sure if you mentioned this in your talk. I'm sorry if you did. Are there similar shapes and similar styles being used um, today as well that you also consider uh, in terms of analogies? Sure. Uh, here in Egypt, we still use uh, the same uh, shapes of not like it looks looks like amphora, but we still use the the pottery uh, storage. Uh, a big storage uh, 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 and use it uh, to uh, store and transform uh, a lot of goods. Hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. So I imagine you had a lot of feedback as well from locals who were watching the experiment uh, taking place? Yeah, sure. No. Okay, interesting. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Basma. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a question here for Linda. Uh, quite a lot of your students seem to have started outside the realms of archaeology and entered the master's program after being experienced uh, in the more practical side of a technology. Do you therefore also encourage people with no archaeological background to apply for the master's? Yes, I do, actually, because archaeology is one of those things where almost every subject you can imagine said A-level in the British system would feed into it. It's It's about things, it's about people, it's about practice, it's about art, it's science. There's a little bit of everything in there. So whatever your background is, you'll probably have an advantage somewhere in that field. And there'll also be a large area where you don't know so much. And it's really just a question of filling in the gaps and working with a kind of a scaffolding, really, of, of what you know already and branching out into the things that you know less, less well. So yes, I, I do think it actually suits people who want to translate what they have been doing into something that is more archaeological in its focus. Great, thank you very much. So uh, good news for all of you crafters and uh, more practically oriented people who are listening. You can definitely continue in archaeology. <laughs> we have a question for James. Um, fascinating talk, thank you. Did the Greeks use sand casting? Um, so they use sand casting in the early archaic, if I remember right. But for any sort of large scale sculptures, they were using uh, lost wax casting. I was using sand casting as part of my research because it was taking away um, doing lost wax casting. It's a whole, you know, 
other dimension of work that goes into it. And I want materials themselves rather than the, uh, the whole process of casting. Okay, no, thank you very much. So that was a, a very <laughs> simple but effective answer. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, we have a question for Chrissy. It is your time to shine, Chrissy. Um, I would love to hear Chrissy uh, expand on the work that she initially did at Sibudu and then later at Border Cave on bedding. What made you think it was bedding in the first place? Hi, everyone, Chrissy speaking. Um, why we actually thought it was bedding was because. Well, it started simply because we'd found a lot of sedge seeds or nutlets, and we tried to work out where the sedge nutlets came from. And while doing that, we worked out that they must have come in on some kind of sedge um, culms or stems. And after sort of developing that idea, we also then looked at the micromorphology and discovered that there were stems in the and leaves in the sediments and so that's how we got to the bedding idea that was at Sabudu where the bedding where there was no desiccated bedding it was all either um, silicified or carbonized and then when we got to border cave it was very obvious because the bedding was desiccated and quite easy to see um, does that answer the question Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a question for Claire. Do you think that recycling of building materials might have continued from earlier periods where communities were more nomadic and therefore might have carried a lot with them, tents, etc.? Is there archaeological evidence for this during the Mesolithic or Neolithic transition? Uh, it's a good question and one can only really speculate. So obviously we know that there is very little uh, in the way of archaeological evidence for Mesolithic settlements. I mean, I know that at Star Car in the north of England, they have evidence of some evidence of stake holes, which would suggest structures. Um, our experience with this building, at least, is that the previous building that occupied the same position had materials within it, which after how it was about five and a half years old by the time we deconstructed it, that the materials inside um, despite the fact that the thatch in that building in particular was extremely thin and of quite a low pitch, but it, it had survived remarkably well. So I would be amazed to think that people didn't reuse uh, any available resources because however effective a Neolithic tool or ax might be in collecting new materials or chopping wood to create a new building, um, it's going to save you a lot of labor to re reuse material. Um, and some wood survives, for example, ash survives remarkably well. Um, it becomes more brittle, but as long as you don't want to bend it, it was completely reusable and has been absorbed into the new building. So I think it's a, a, a sensible uh, conclusion that this might have been a continuation of um, Mesolithic, more hunter-gatherer type uh, movements around the landscape that you would have continued to carry stuff with you and that would translate into building more permanent buildings and recycling and reuse of any any material that was still usable. Okay, thanks. Actually, in the converse of that, is was there any material that you saw um, definitely wasn't reusable. So I, I don't, I'm just imagining I, uh, wood that would have been in the ground might not have been as good, but maybe I, I'm not so sure myself about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we tend to find that oak survives uh, the longest um, if in earth fast structures um, and the ash doesn't last so well, but as long as the ash is not in the ground, it's a really good material to use. And obviously in the past, it would have been readily available uh, yes, yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, the, the wood in the ground will rot away quite quickly, regardless of whether you char the timbers or not, it will still decay. Um, so, there, so I guess you can reuse buildings in the sense that you can take the bottom off the timbers and reduce the length of the timber and reuse it. And we have actually, we've done that here. Um, we've seen it in archeological evidence as well, that it looks like people are probably reusing and shortening the timbers and the building just reduces in, in height over time. I think I've read ethnographic um, sources which would suggest that as well, that the building just becomes lower and lower until it's not really an occupiable space and then you start again. 
Thank you for that. We have another question for Tammy. Do you see any patterns in tool preference from your participants in the workshop um, when painting with ochre, so sticks versus fingers, etc.? It, it kind of it depends. I think it, it starts out that people go, okay, we're painting, we need a paintbrush. So they'll they'll stick to the paintbrush. And then I have to remind them that you can use the sticks. And we often get really nice responses that they go, wow, we can make a really fine line and other little details and do you know, put the 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 paint on the page and then engrave into the, the wet paint with the stick. Um, but, and then it's usually only later that people will be a bit more keen to get their, their fingers dirty and use their hands. And then kids usually go completely over the top and start painting their faces and their legs. And kind of, it takes a little bit of time for them to, to get into it. Um, but, and every now and then you'll get some people that are that are really keen to experiment a little bit more and they'll try anything that they can find or pick up a stone tool and try paint with that. Um, but but generally, and maybe it's, it's, maybe it's how I structure it that you think of it as a kind of a painting workshop. So you think paintbrush, um, but maybe if I suggested fingers first, maybe that's what they would try first. Would you ever uh, consider, I don't know, doing more kind of insight uh, workshops, shall we say, so outside and then you just provide them with the ochre and see where they go with it, if they paint rocks or themselves or things like that? Yeah, it's actually a good point. We have at, at Wits University, there's a lot of, we honor like this shale outcrop, so it's great. I mean, you can just, anytime there's any building, I, I go scavenging for, for ochre pieces. And so we could so easily do a work, workshop outside and then people can you know, pick leaves or find feathers or whatever and make make actually their own paintbrushes as well or their own tools to paint. So yeah, it's a good point. And especially with COVID, it's great. You want to do outdoor things. True, yes. <laughs> the more outdoor, the better. And we actually yeah. have a follow-up question to this from Basma, um, asking if you think that people in the past, what did they use? Did they use their fingers uh, or their sticks? So in most of the South African rock art is, is brush painted. Um, and they would have, I mean, must have been really skilled at making good paintbrushes as well. So using animal fur or feathers. And um, so you get really beautiful fine lined rock art. Um, but then you also find um, with, with different, as different groups moved around South Africa as well, there was a mixing and you have, you have finger painted rock arts in different colors, usually, you know, ranging in the, the ochre colors and the reds and oranges and yellows, and then uh, sometimes whites and, and black as well. Um, but yeah, it's mostly, most of the South African rock arts is, is brush painted. Hey, that's very interesting. I, I'm completely ignorant about this topic, so I had just assumed that brushes were much, much later. Um, but yeah, that's sure. very interesting. Yes. Well, so let me just put it so Middle Stone Age, you know, then you don't have any evidence of, of painted art. Um, but in the, the later Stone Age, so the oldest dated rock art we have is in Namibia, which is 27,000 years old. Um, but most of the dated art, rock art in South Africa is from about 5,000 to 2,000 or 1,000 years ago. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Okay, I have a question for Victoria. Uh, I understand that this was a student project. From your perspective, uh, did the experimental component make it more interesting? And so do you plan on continuing doing experimental archaeology and why or why not? Um, definitely. Being able to actually have, get my hands on practical things. I prefer to I'm a, I'm a visual learner and tactile learner. I like to actually work with things. So having it be an experiment um, made, did definitely make it a lot more interesting for me. Um, and yes, as I mentioned earlier, I am continuing it into my master's research. Perfect, yes, great. Always need more experimental archeologists. Um, <laughs> I was also curious, did you uh, trample the stones yourself, uh, the, the ground, I should say, yourself, or was it animals or? Uh, no, so I, I did it myself. Um, it was a period of a whole month, 10 minutes a day, stumping, jumping around on a little place in my garden that I had <laughs> made into a little trampling pit. Um, it was supposed to be on the varsity campus, but because of COVID, I had to do it at home. So luckily I found a nice space to dig up <laughs> that um, wasn't destroying my garden completely. And yeah, I did it all myself. Perfect, okay. I imagine you got some good step counts in. Um, <laughs> nice, okay. Thank you very much. 
Uh, we have another question for James, uh, following on from your uh, previous answer. Would there be a difference in the result of the sculpture um, in the lost wax method versus sand casting? Yeah, so with sand casting, unless you get the sand you know, incredibly uh, compacted, you'll have a little more porosity in it. With the lost wax casting, um, you're forming uh, clay over it, so you can get a very sort of flush um, uh, surface. So you require, it will require less um, sanding, cleaning up in the, in the post-casting process. Okay, interesting. Out of curiosity, were you already, you sound like you already had quite a lot of experience with metalworking and casting? I had literally none, actually. Um, my, and you're very uh, confident. Previous degree, <laughs> my previous degree was in classics, and I'd spent you know, years studying sculpture without actually having um, learned anything about producing them, because classics doesn't really focus on um, production or um, the more human side of archaeology. It focuses very much on the arts and the sort of um, styles and the narratives you can draw from various sculptures. So um, it's actually the reason I got into experimental archaeology was that um, I wanted to learn how these done, and um, uh, that's why I went to the I did the program. <laughs> okay, nice. So we have the other side of things. Did you then um, work with uh, experienced casters or metal workers, or are you planning to do that for future experiments? I would really like to work more with some experienced people. I got um, the opportunity to work with Neil Burridge during uh, during the master's program for a couple of days where he cast a few um, axes. But other than that, I was mostly just going off of reading and um, watching uh, documentaries on castings for the most part. A lot of it was um, very ad hoc when it came to uh, setting up the, the process. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh no, but that's uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question for Fergus. Um, thank you for your presentation and everyone else's. Uh, will the experiment be facing the prevailing wind? Could the thatch at the edges be unequally exposed? Will you be trying combinations of thatch material? Uh, for example, a turf base layer and a heather outer layer. Also, what happens to old thatched roofs at Butzer and have any been analyzed botanically? So first part was, could the thatch at the ends be unequally exposed if they face the prevailing wind? We haven't decided yet, it was one of the questions in the presentation, we haven't decided yet whether the, um, the sort of test rig we're going to set up will face the prevailing weather or away from it or whatever. Um, we haven't seen a lot of difference uh, on the existing roundhouses, um, no matter which point of the compass you look at, as long as the uh, thatch layer or whatever material we're using on the roof is well attached. It doesn't seem to be a huge difference depending on whether you're into the prevailing weather or away from it. Um, okay. Moving on uh, to the other one, you were saying about sort of combinations. Yes, indeed. I, I glossed over that in the presentation because you just get so many permutations of things. Something like bracken, for example, which was one of the materials we want to test. My feeling at the outset would be that bracken would probably be perfect for a, a temporary short-lived shelter like you might put up for lambing, which we're going through at Butzer at the moment, something that would just last a few weeks and then would start to break apart. But bracken might be a wonderful material as a base coat to be topped with a thin layer of thatch or something. But there are just so many permutations once you start getting combinations of, of layers. And specifically, um, turf was mentioned there. The, the thing with turf roofs, um, we've done a couple in the past and the, the actual timbers for the roof structure need to be a hell of a lot uh, thicker, more substantial because there's a lot more weight with the soil there able to soak up uh, rainwater and put a load more, um, you know, load bearing on the roof structure itself. Okay, thanks. Uh, the last part of that question was um, what happens to the old thatched roofs at Butzer? Have any been analysed botanically? I believe the last time we had any done was Reading University, um, our previous largest roundhouse on site. They actually came in and they did some analysis on that, but I don't remember what conclusions they came to. They also trenched across the floor and stuff, but I thought they did look at the, the actual roof. Because of the um, burning fires inside the house all the time, 
we do find it really does tend to kill off insect life uh, in the thatch. So there's not really much living in there. Um, but okay. yeah, I'll need to go back and see what Reading University concluded because it's a long time since I've looked at that. Oh, okay, no, that's an interesting idea though. Also that they dug trenches, that's uh, really interesting to hear. Um, I guess it's a perfect opportunity. There's lots of examples. Is, is Was that also something, I can't remember, I'm afraid, that happened at Butzer in terms of uh, uh, excavations happening during uh, rebuilding or during uh, something to, to see what happened after five years, 10 years, et cetera? Uh, yes, I have to say, Reading University, definitely on their largest house, they put several trenches across the floor and the wall boundaries um, just to see what was going on there. Um, most of the time we tend to take the buildings down and, and not do that sort of post demolition work. Okay, out of curiosity, that one, do you know if it was a, a blind uh, trench dig or did they? already know what was there i think it was blind actually yeah it would make sense but uh, that's uh, an interesting uh, concept thank you very much uh, fergus continuing with uh, butzer ancient farm and directionality uh, trevor uh, we have some questions for you here um, is it correct that the entrance to bronze age roundhouses generally faced southeast so they could catch the early morning sun in the winter um bronze age i I'm less clear about it at the moment, but Iron Age, it's generally said that that's the case for Iron Age. However, um, there is a, an opposing opinion on that. Um, Rachel Pope has done a, her, her dissertation, her PhD dissertation. Basically, um, if you like, disproved that, it's certainly in northern British roundhouses, and found that there was a bit of selective um, selective material, selective choosing of sites to, to, to try and justify an idea that... Um, either there was a sort of solar cult or there was a, a desire to get early morning sun. So there is a tendency for them to, in the Iron Age, and I suspect the Bronze Age as well, a tendency for them to, to, to face somewhere between uh, east and south. Tendency, but there are many, many roundhouses that face in all sorts of other directions. In fact, there's a whole settlement uh, in Wales where all of the doorways face west. They liked a stiff morning breeze with their uh, breakfast, apparently. <laughs> well, one interesting thing is because the prevailing wind in Britain is from the west, we find that our roundhouses, most of which face uh, roughly east uh, of the doorways, they perform much better smoke-wise. Um, none of us likes to be in the one roundhouse that has a west-facing door um, because, generally speaking, the prevailing wind just forces the smoke sort of into your face and doesn't allow it to draw through the roof. So, practically, they seem to work very well, but they are not universal in any way, shape or form. Okay. Oh, no, that's very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, also, another question. Um, is it possible that the early Bronze Age earth house could have been accessible from a hole in the roof and down a log ladder? Um, I saw this question earlier. I love it. Um, there is both evidence and inference on the way uh, roundhouses were accessed. Um, the evidence, most clear evidence, is that many roundhouses uh, in both Bronze and Iron Age show clear doorways. Often they have a porch feature on the doorway, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a clear and well-used entrance. Um, the other evidence really is that uh, um, there is some evidence for the structure of the roofs uh, in both Bronze Age and Iron Age roundhouse, which survives in the archaeology, uh, particular at, uh, particularly at Mass Farm, which is a really important Bronze Age site where we, we, we see the structure of the roof. Um, the structures of the roofs are also written about in, uh, in some of the Roman historians' work, and there is, in fact, some evidence of Gaulish roundhouses depicted on one of the uh, triumphal columns in Rome, maybe Trajan's columns. So we know that the roofs had quite a, a conical or dome shape, which means that you'd have to basically build a ladder to climb up on the roof and then climb down. Um, so practically, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but um, what I think is great about the question is the real answer is I don't know. I've never seen I've never seen a Bronze Age roundhouse. I'm quite old, but not quite that old. And what we're trying to do is introduce a, a level of indeterminacy in our um, in our interpretation. So we have a, a wide range of chronologies uh, on the farm now, and how structure changes a lot over the really over the um, four thousand years of, of chronology we now cover. What what we want to do for our visitors is to make sure that they're asking those same questions. 
we're only pr proposing a hypothesis with our houses. So we would really love our visitors to come with exactly those questions because, you know, we don't have the answers. So it's a perfectly legitimate question. Um, as I say, we, we do have good evidence for doorways in Bronze Age roundhouses and Iron Age roundhouses, not evidence for our house. Um, the other, the other answer to the, the other, the other inference we can make is that um, if you put a hole in the roof in uh, in Britain, um, it'll get wet on the inside, and uh, that's actually not a trivial answer, um, because it leads me to something else which I, I didn't fully answer before on the question about the walling. So I'll just digress and then shut up. But um, at the end of the Bronze Age, we're, we're getting sort of towards the end of the Bronze Age with the house we're building. The climate appears to get uh, rather cool and wetter in Britain. And through the Iron Age, we get the formation of a lot of peat. So um, we peat walling is, is very possible in British, um, uh, uh, British prehistory. His, prehistoric houses, and it's certainly known from historic housing. Um, however, we also dismiss peat walling as there's, there's no peat in the area, in, um, in the area that we're, we're basing our archaeology from in the south, as I said, very thin soils, so they didn't develop those thick layers of peat. If we were in the north of Britain, we would certainly consider that as a walling option. So I hope that more fully answers that earlier question about walling as well. No, oh, great. Thanks. I actually just saw that someone has posted a question. Have you tried using the cob technique for building the walls? As this wouldn't leave traces in the archaeological record and there are still old buildings in Devon built from cob? Yes, um, that's that's essentially what we're going to be using is cob or, or rammed earth. Um, so it's, it's basically using using earth, which usually has something added to it, um, like a a, a fibrous material to, to give it a, a certain degree of flexibility. Uh, it's wet and then it's rammed into, um, usually into some sort of formwork. So it's, it's basically compressed and it forms a really durable wall. Um, it'll last for centuries. And so that's, uh, I think that's my understanding of cob in any event. Um, um, that's what we're going to be using. Um, as far as we know, as I mentioned earlier, we may consider other variations on it, but that will be the main walling technique. Um, what's interesting for us is that um, I mentioned before that the soils we have are, are quite light, um, uh, glacial lower soils, and we don't have a lot of clay. Um, and I think clay would form a, it, it potentially would form a more durable wall. So we'll be interested to see how, whether our earth wall uh, is very durable or whether the material is just doesn't have enough clay in it to bind well. Um, we'll actually build the roof, the, the frame of the roundhouse uh, first, build the roof and then thatch it and then build the walls up underneath it because um, erosion we think will be such a problem with the sort of, uh, sort of soils that we have around here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very detailed answer. We have a couple more questions here from our speakers to each other. Uh, so our first question is from James to Linda. First of all, congrats on 20 years of the experimental MA. I love doing my master's there. I've heard a lot of students from Exeter saying how much they enjoy doing, doing the master's program there. I was wondering if you had any big plans for the program going forward. Oh boy, that, that's huge. And, and thank you, James. I have to say one of the really nice things is just seeing how many people are here doing things and, and just it's giving me a real buzz. And, and sometimes, as you can imagine, you run a program and you get the bureaucracy. Um, but actually, this is the stuff that makes it worthwhile. So there's a couple of ideas I've had going forward. I mean, this this year, it's been an extraordinary year. And I've currently got students that I'm actually teaching um, practical elements to in Dubai, California, Slovenia, South Korea. It, it's, it's been such a challenge. But it's also made me really think, you know, there are ways to do things and there are ways to really make the hands on face to face do perhaps even more than we were doing with it already. But there are also things that can be done at a distance. And, and that's something I'm certainly going to think about. The other thing I have to say is, is just there are so many people who I kind of just chivered them a little bit. So a, a kind of a gentle kick. Um, and that meant that they've turned their master's dissertations into presentations for the conference. And I am thinking I'm not going to let them slide back from that. And I'm, I'm thinking, OK, how can we have a kind of a discussion group to kick them into the next stage, the publications arising from that? 
And how can we make sure that that happens and rolls through so that it's like, OK, well, you've done this. Now you do this. Now you do this. And so I've got ideas about how to incorporate that and have it so that it kind of feeds back into the present master's students, because I think everybody will benefit from that kind of intermingling of different years within the program and, and how they can take it forward. And I guess the other one is, you know, my colleagues over the years have changed. And so my colleagues are influencing some of the things I'm thinking about. So Alex Pryor with Fire, Hanalka Herald with some of her work with glass beads now, as well as pottery. Um, we've also obviously got metallurgy with Jill and forensics with the lovely Laura Evis. Um, she has really opened my eyes to the way in which so much of what is done in the name of forensics relies on experiments. And there is always a way in which there is a crossover between the two subjects. And we've been co-teaching a module this year. And I just think, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways. And working with people from the Human Animal Environment um, Center and the Center for the Archaeology of the Americas, you know, there are ways to make combinations work with your colleagues and, and they take you in directions that you'd never really planned out for yourself, but which are really interesting ways to, to be working with people. You find out more about your colleagues, you find out things that you didn't know, and I like that. So more of that stuff, I think, more of things we don't know yet. Okay, it sounds very promising, I think, <laughs> for the future. Uh, Basma, actually moving on from that, what is the status at the moment of experimental archaeology in Egypt from your perspective? Do you see it as something that's increasing in popularity? Actually, my uh, researchers were the only and the first uh, experimental archaeology studies in Egypt. Uh, no one here uh, know too much about experimentation and there is no one to help to fundraise in such uh, researches. That's why uh, students here uh, doesn't prefer to, uh, to use this uh, methodology in their research. But I started that and uh, I think uh, I'm doing uh, a lot of public uh, uh, lectures to let people know more about experimentation and, and how it is useful for museology and heritage. I'm trying to do that uh, my way yeah, without uh, any help. <laughs> Okay. Oh gosh, sounds like a lot of work for one person. Um, how does the the public uh, in general react to uh, ideas of experimental archaeology? Actually, they like the idea very much, but uh, once they started to think about uh, money and how much I will spend for this research, they uh, they stopped to uh, think about it again. But uh, my <laughs> lectures, Alhamdulillah, I think uh, they like it very much. They like the way I. Uh, I try to show them uh, how uh, it is important to any archaeologist to do uh, practical things, to know more. Yes, no, I think so, which is also what other people yeah, indeed have been saying. And I mean, I imagine that the research that is happening in Egypt, it, there's so much archaeological research happening there. There must be many opportunities for different projects to emerge. Yes, they do it the academic way, uh, only the research uh, uh, a normal research, uh, but the experimental, uh, no, no one use experimentation here yet, except me. Linda had asked a question about Chrissy's experiments with sleeping on the sedge. Uh, so perhaps you could expand a little more, Chrissy. Well, um, I did gather cypress sedges down in the Sabudu River. I mean, the river near Sabudu. Cypress has a very long and spongy stem and it's quite easy to harvest. And I carried them up to the cave and I lay down on them and they were incredibly comfortable. And I used to make visiting lecturers also lie down on the sedge. And everyone agreed it's a very comfortable um, and fresh smelling, except for little pests. Sometimes a tickle crawl out at you, things like that. It's a very pleasant thing to lie on. Um, in contemporary society, a lot of people still use those cypress textilis um, calms for making um, mats, which are commonly known as single beds. Um, they're really, they're quite long lasting and they work very well. So that's at Sabudu, at Border Cave, we recognized rather than sedges, we recognized 
that the bedding was dominated by grasses. And uh, we didn't have grass seeds, but the phytoliths indicated that they were probably um, the leaves and stems were from panicum. And co in contemporary times, panicum grows at the mouth of the cave. So two guys decided to volunteer to sleep at the cave one night on panicum bedding. And they enjoyed it. They said, well, no, I mustn't say they enjoyed it. They were pleased with themselves for doing it. <laughs> but they sort of kept on rolling out of bed because the floor wasn't flat. And, of course, they couldn't flatten the floor because of the archaeological um, deposits beneath them. So they didn't say that the grass was uncomfortable to lie on. And so I think that it makes a pretty good bedding because not only the archaeology, but the ethnography, quite widespread across South Africa, talks about grasses um, being used for bedding, but often with additives like sweet-smelling herbs and um, also not always only one material. Sometimes you'll have a mixture of sedges and grasses. And so, yes, so I haven't spent a whole night on a grass bed, but I have used the sedges and I think it'll work very well for anyone when they're out camping to try it. Oh, sounds like a, a nice, uh, for when the sun starts to come out uh, here in Europe, people can go out and see if we can start trying to do these things. I have a slightly related question um, about, uh, you mentioned talking about preventing the pests in the bedding by uh, fire. Uh, as a byproduct of fire uh, activities. Do you think that this was knowledge that was passed down through generations or was it an accidental discovery um, made as a byproduct of lighting fires near bedding? I think it's quite difficult to answer that question because one can't really be sure, but certainly people would have recognized the sanitizing properties of ash. And we find ash quite widely used um, in Southern Africa for sanitizing. So for example, chili mixed with ash will be used to keep seeds um, free of pests. And so I think that perhaps at Sabudu and at um, Border Cave, people were burning the bedding, not only to get rid of pests, and I'm sure it got pretty smelly. I mean, we see little bits of bone, various other things in the bedding that would have made it smelly. And so you burn it and you have this twofold um, good result that you have a flat surface, which is nice and smooth. And then you also have the fact that insects can't, don't like to um, move over ash because it affects them and deters them. So yes, to get back to the question, I do think that people would have recognized the efficacy of ash. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Uh, I see actually that you had posted a, a question in the chat as well to Fergus related to this. Um, your, so for Fergus, this is for you. Your observation about smoke from fires killing pest in the thatch is interesting. Um, Chrissy notes that in South Africa, there are ethnographic records of fires with wood that produces poisonous fumes deliberately being lit in huts that are then shut up. Might this have happened in the Iron Age as well? Uh, what I said in response to that is that I'm not aware of any use of special woods or plants that could be burnt um, to produce a toxic atmosphere in the house to kill off pests. Um, just the normal smoke from wood fires seems to be enough. And um, I've certainly observed in the past at Butzer with a newish roundhouse that we hadn't yet started having fires in, um, that birds were pulling apart the thatch in order to get out insects that were living in the thatch but that once we started having fires regularly in there, so just normal wood smoke filtering out through the thatch, um, it clearly killed the insects in the thatch and the bird behavior then changed and they were no longer landing on the roof and poking around in the roof to find insects. They seemed to know that uh, there was gonna be nothing there for them. Um, but it's an interesting question. Coming much um, further forward in time, I know when tobacco was introduced, that that was used for fumigation, um, certainly in Victorian times, but in terms of the prehistoric period, 
I'm, I'm not aware of any special plants being used to produce a particularly toxic smoke. Okay, thank you very much. We will oh. return. Oh, sorry, carry on, Chrissy. Sorry, I should have put my hand up. No, no, what I wanted to say is that in ancient times, for example, at Sabudu, as well as, as at Border Cave in the Middle Stone Age, we have charcoal of a very, very poisonous wood. And if one burns that wood and you smell the smoke, you have um, uh, quite strange experiences, but it will also poison meat. And so the people burning that wood 60,000 years ago, I think also 200,000 years ago, would have known that it was poisonous. And so perhaps there's a history of the burning of poisonous woods for specific purposes far, far back in time. Great. Thank you very much for that insight. Uh, we're going to return now to Victoria. You've had a load of questions come through for you. Um, so first one is, why boil the bones? Wouldn't people in the past have used them fresh? And how might this have altered the results? Um, for example, boiling, possibly weakening the bone, residual grease in fresh unboiled bones, uh, causing the tools to interact differently with the worked materials, grains in the substrate, etc. cetera. Um, so I boiled them so that I could take better um, microscopic images of them so that none of the um, meat or periosteum is in the way of taking the photos before and after use and after trampling. Otherwise, you can't get very clear images. Um, I'm not sure how its use with the meat and flesh and everything on it would have um, affected the experiment because I've always just seen that the bones get cleaned before use. Yeah, no, I think uh, that's a fair enough answer, I would say. Um, <laughs> another question uh, is how compacted were your experimental substrates? My concern would be that artificial substrates would likely not be as compacted as natural substrates, potentially resulting in more vertical movement um, within the substrate, perhaps leading to less breakage, but more scratching. So how did you account for uh, the difference in perhaps uh, com uh, artificial versus natural? So um, the compaction, I mean, it would only happen um, over the 30 day period of me trampling. So obviously it's not going to be as much as, you know, thousands of years of trampling in, in an area. Um, the vertical movement was not I didn't, uh, the experiment wasn't necessarily looking at movement within the sediment, so um, I didn't pay much attention to it, um, other than noting which sediment had more movement than others, but I, I didn't, you know, specifically look at horizontal and vertical movement um, of the bones in the sediment. Um, but yeah, beach sand definitely had the most movement because it's the least compact, and the clay sand immediately just compacted and things barely moved within that sediment. Okay, and is this something you're planning to then look at further in, uh, in your future work? Possibly. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, about the whole trampling aspect, but more of looking at the actual marks that I found from these experiments and then comparing them to actual bones and bone flakes from sites that we found such as classes in South Africa to have a look and determine possibly if any of these flakes are actually um, utilized bone or just the result of trampling. Okay, thank you. So uh, Victoria, another one more question for you, then I'll let you take a break. Uh, you talked about picking the function of the bone flakes based on their shape, rather than trying to create a specific shape planned uh, based on a planned function. Do you have archaeological evidence for this? Or why did you uh, use this approach? So I kind of looked at it, I don't want to say logically, but, you know, to pick a bone that's sharp and easy to hold would be easier for cutting um, than to pick a bone that's randomly um, shaped and odd shaped and not easy to hold. So um, just kind of based on assumption of what would have been easier to do, I, I didn't particularly... Um, shape any of the bones to use. I, I used just the raw whatever came off when I um, 
used a hammer stone to break the break the bone flakes off. So I just decided to do what seemed easiest. Oh, that sounds reasonable, especially I think the amount of work to do. It's always nice to not always overcomplicate <laughs> yeah. things. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you. Okay, we have some more questions here for Tammy. Um, wonderful work and stunning material. Uh, <laughs> apologies, many questions from another ochre lover. So prepare yourself. Um, <laughs> the participants in your ochre painting workshops don't seem to wear any cover to protect their clothes. It sounds silly, um, but I had questions from parents and participants uh, for my workshops ask, asking if ochre with water will stain their clothes, um, which sort of happens with red ochre. Did you have similar questions? Uh, do you work with people around Africa still processing ochre traditionally and using it? Uh, who would know more about this? Cool. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of mess and ochre is awesome. And I always tell people they have to embrace ochre. But I think yeah, the reality of it is that you don't want most parents are not going to want their kids coming home with stained clothes or stained school uniforms, especially. Um, so. But it, it doesn't stain. It can mostly, if it's just mixed with water, even the darker red ochre powder, it's it washes off pretty easily. Even, even on your hands, you might need to take a few washes, but on clothes, I've never had issues. And I'm often, I get ochre all over me and I, I can wash most of it out. <laughs> um, I do, we do sometimes do experiments when you're mixing with, with egg or with coconut oil or something that you might have a little bit more staining properties, but on the whole, we haven't had issues with that. Um, and then the thing on, on working with other communities around, well, South, South Africa more is, is where I've done any work and it's more in, incidental for incidental for my, my own work that when I see someone that is using um, an ochre paste or a red paste on their face, I will always ask them, you know, where do they get it from? Are they getting it from a river naturally? Are they getting a clay that they that they just mixing with a bit of water and putting on their face? Um, and but a lot of it, or I'll ask them, you know, just ask them where they got it from. But a lot of the time, people are actually just buying store bought iron oxide, it's really cheap, and mixing it with water and using it as sunscreen. Um, it, it is used richly here with many of the, the cultures in South Africa, but a lot of the time, when I've chatted to people, it's, it's just used as a very um, cheap sunscreen, basically. Um, and, and, it's, and it's pretty effective as a sunscreen as well. Um, but I would love to do more work. I know, again, Rian Rifkin has done some work with the uh, Ovahimba in Namibia. And I think generally in terms of Middle Stone Age research, there's been lots of ties with how the, the Ovahimba process their ochre and what they mix with the ochre. They're, you'll see beautiful images of, of people completely covered in an ochre paste, their, their hair and jewelry and clothes and their whole bodies. And, um, and just there's been some ethnographic research done on you know, what are they mixing with with it? They mix animal fat or what kinds of ochre are they using for this this ritual and and it's as a skin protection skin protection. Um, but me myself, I haven't I haven't done much. Sounds like it's the only thing you need, really. I mean, if you have ochre, you have everything. <laughs> you don't, don't need any other material. I agree. <laughs> Um, out of, for, for people who are interested, we've had a couple of comments from people saying they're interested in learning more about it, um, tools and techniques, etc. Uh, because I think especially uh, here in, in Northwest Europe, um, ochre was used as well for many, many thousands of years. Um, mm. But there are, there's not as many sources, perhaps. Um, can you recommend any sources? Someone has mentioned apparently Rian Rifkin's experiments with ochre and hide tanning. Yeah. Uh, but yes, if you have any more that you can suggest for people. Yes. Oh, well, sure. I, would, I mean, there's, there's so much. I think yeah, they, everyone is welcome to to contact me. Um, I do go by two names. My, I'm Tammy Hotchkiss, but my married surname is Reynard. Um, so just in case there's any confusion with that. Um, but yeah, please, please contact me. I'm happy to give papers. I'm, I'm happy to send ochre with love from South Africa. And um, yeah, I'd love to connect with more people. Perfect. Thank you, Tammy. Okay. On that point. Yes, I just saw Linda. To Go for it. So I found Tammy's talk wonderful, but there's been so much about ochre at the conference. It's both colourful, but it's got this unique quality of drawing people in somehow because of the colour. But then there are all of these other useful things. And so, Tammy, we'd love to have a chat with you. My colleague, Teresa Emmerich Camper, is speaking later on today. And both she and I do a lot of work with hide tanning. Um, I have used ochre 
and done work with it and so has Teresa. So we'd love to be part of those discussions. Cool, yeah. that would be wonderful. I'd love to as well. Cool, no, it is an amazing, an amazing um, material. And it is, like you say, it just is so versatile, which makes it interpretations in the ancient past very difficult because we don't know were people choosing it just because it's red or were they choosing it for the various other uses? I mean, it can even be eaten as an iron supplement, you know, so um, it's, an, it's an amazing material. It's so also, I don't know if you found its smell is so distinctive. And in the same way, if you cut yourself, the smell of blood is a particular smell. It's because of the iron and the ochre smells the same way. Yes, that's interesting. I suppose, you know, there's different sources and you get some like really nice like almost wet shales that or that feel almost fatty you know and they've got like a nice shine to them and it yeah. would depend on the source some are very clay um but it's, it's a very good point actually yeah that it is that that connection with iron and and with our blood and it's cool okay on that uh, happy note blood uh, <laughs> i will uh, yeah. move back to housing <laughs> so fergus um in regards to uh, I, also, Trevor mentioned in his um, presentation uh, the terms of what was the most practical and that side of things. But uh, do you also take into account, for example, stylistic influences, also maybe status uh, materials? I, I can vaguely remember learning somewhere about how different tile colors during the 1600s in the Netherlands would have represented the owner's wealth because some were more expensive than others. Do you know of any similar examples to this or hypothesized examples for? earlier uh, roofing materials as well? Uh, simple answer, no. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> right. um, it's a really interesting question. And mm. um, I, I got some information yesterday um, that came through from uh, some of the uh, archaeological excavation at Must Farm, the site I mentioned before, where they've discovered the roofing materials included clay, turf and thatch, which kind of confirms my long-held belief that I think most roofs in prehistory uh, or many roofs in prehistory would have actually been um, a composite of, of a lot of different materials. Um, if I use one example of a roundhouse that we have on site, to thatch it to a waterproof standard, it's a large building, it's 15 metres around with a 45 degree uh, pitch on the roof, so a large cone, it would take somewhere between 17, um, 17, let's say about 10 hectares of land, all under a cereal crop with good length, uh, with good, good length um, cereal um, stalks to thatch that roof. Um, and that sort of, that gives you some idea of the sort of resources that are needed. Um, so I think in many cases, uh, a lot of the, um, issues surrounding roofs will be resource based. Um, so, you know, uh, imagining someone in the Bronze Age planting 10 hectares of a long straw uh, cereal just to harvest it for a roof seems to stretch credibility. Um, but that said, uh, I, I suspect that there were, um, there were status um, differences in uh, in roofing that sort of became evidence uh, became evident but yeah my, my my overall belief is that the vast majority would have been a, a composite of different materials um, based on convenience okay so also a mixture of both convenience and and choice in, in that respect one might say yeah i don't want to take human agency out of the out of the equation um, altogether, so I'm sure I'm sure there are preferences, but I, I think often th the sheer practicality of the sort of resource management meant you uh, you were often sort of dictated to a little bit by your circumstances. Okay, no, that's very interesting. Uh, I have another question for you while you're here. Uh, do you think there were separate work buildings for tasks such as metalworking, grain storage, processing, and other things that would not work well in a dwelling? Uh, yes, um, yes, and yes. Um, one, I don't actually like the, the, the name roundhouse because in general, we had no idea whether it was a house or whether it served some other function. Um, uh, so uh, often on site, we will call our buildings houses, uh, Neolithic house, uh, Iron Age roundhouse, that sort of thing, Anglo-Saxon house. But um, we often don't have evidence like hards or uh, other material evidence to suggest that it was used as a house. And in fact, it may have been a room so the houses may have been sort of uh, deconstructed 
um, as I think in some African villages, you often find um, small unit uh, buildings that serve as one's a bedroom, one is a kitchen, um, and so on. Um, so even within the scope of a roundhouse, um, I think a lot of them weren't houses. They were used for sort of craft functions or uh, processing of materials or maybe just sort of lounge, lounge activities. Um, and also uh, in the Iron Age archaeology of Britain, for example, there are vastly more rectangular buildings than there are circular buildings. The general consensus is that circular buildings were domestic and that rectangular buildings were uh, served other functions, which could be, again, could be craft manufacturing um, and storage, grain storage and things like that. So, yeah, I think there was, I, I hope that answers the question. I think I sort of wandered off the scene, but I think, I think the term house, as I was using roundhouse, it's a term that historically we're stuck with, like Stone Age and things like that, Bronze Age that no one particularly likes, but we're stuck with it. But I think it's a misnomer it certainly can't be applied universally to uh, to all buildings that happen to be round. I'm sure they serve different purposes. No, it's also, that's an interesting point as well. Perhaps uh, things should be reconsidered in terms of naming conventions and uh, those side of things. Um, okay, we have, while we're on Butzer, I uh, have a question for Claire. How was the first Neolithic structure um, damaged by the storm you mentioned? Uh, so the walls, the roof, the overall structure, how was the damage spread? Do you think the orientation of the house and or uh, the surrounding environment, so trees, for example, uh, impacted on the damage, making it worse or, or saving the house? Um, thank you for the presentation. It's a very interesting example of accidental damage. OK, so to go back to the beginning, if I can remember all of these uh, questions correctly. I can repeat if I need to. <laughs> um, so the way in which the building was damaged by the storm is partly, I think, to do with the materials from which the building was originally constructed. This is the previous building, not the one we've recently constructed. So the previous building was based on some archaeological evidence that came from the north of Wales. And that archaeological evidence suggested very, very small post holes. In other words, this was a quite large structure of about 12 metres length by six metres width uh, with upright posts uh, for the construction of very small diameter, only about 10, 15 centimetres maximum diameter. And it was really an experiment by one of my um, colleagues to demonstrate that this could have been a viable structure and that it could have been roofed. So I think the fact that it lasted for over five years before this damage um, was really a testament to his building abilities. But that said, obviously because of the small diameter of the timbers, when this storm hit the building, as one of the questions says, was the way the building was situated um, partly why it was damaged by the storm? And my answer is probably yes. So a combination of the direction from which the storm would have come and the angle which the building faced, that prevailing wind, um, played a large part in making the building start to twist. Um, and this is to do with the way the building was constructed inside. And because of the small timbers, we couldn't really, we, we braced it, but there's a limit to what you can achieve. So the first thing we really noticed is that all of the daub on the building had huge cracks across the back wall. And that back wall was actually facing directly into where the prevailing wind would have been hitting the building. So that's really what happened is that over time, I think um, this was the, this was, excuse the pun, the final straw. Um, oh. And this really exposed the weaknesses of the building. Okay, that's interesting. And so I suppose similar to the, Trevor's answer earlier about orientation, do you think that where they would have been structured in terms of, of wind and things would also have been taken into account in that respect, in terms of how much damage would have been? Uh... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the doorway in that building faced, faced nominally south, which is based on archaeological evidence. Um, but I think it must that must have played an enormous part. Of course, our interpretation, the three-dimensional interpretation from the archaeological footprint um, is simply an interpretation and that applies to all of the buildings we construct. So that building had a gable end. What I mean by that is a vertical wall of daub right up to the top of the building with a small gap at the top. Um, 
for smoke to travel out of. So what we did is create a, a single face against which the wind would have blown. And our experience at Butts Ancient Farm shows you that a round building survives uh, bad weather much better than these buildings with large gable ends. So there's a huge advantage to building in a round structure is that there's nothing for the wind to blow against. It travels around the building. So I guess if you look at this, the, the previous building, we only interpreted it in one way with this vertical gable wall, but there could have been other interpretations. Perhaps the roof could have been hipped. So the end as well as the sides could have been at a 45 degree angle. That was just a diff that could have been a different interpretation and perhaps it would have responded differently to that storm. But I guess we'll, we'll never know now. Well, are, are you planning to build any more with that in mind, with, with those uh, in different alternative interpretations, shall we say? Yeah, it's a really interesting thing. Uh, of course, the, you build a building in one way, um, and sometimes you do remedial work, you repair things as the building travels through its lifespan. And again, my colleague did this uh, with one of the buildings. We have more than one Stone Age building. There are two smaller buildings. One of them is called enigmatically 851 and that's from Durrington Walls which is a site just near Stonehenge and after a few years of its existence it too was starting to suffer from possibly damage by wind it also had a gable end and actually my colleague revised the roof structure uh, midway through the building's lifespan and created a, like a hit feature on two more sites so that all of the roof is actually on a slope now and the building has continued therefore to it's given it a bit more longevity so we in a way we kind of we explored that concept through doing that okay great thank you very much uh, so we have a couple more questions and then i'll uh, wrap up so a question for basma uh, we actually had we had another talk uh, yesterday i think about uh, the use of animals in experiments so uh, using horses this time uh, you mentioned already that there are uh, vessels in a very similar shape that are still used quite often in Egypt um, so were the camels already used to carrying this kind of load how did they react to carrying the amphorae did it seem to bother them more or less did it not really make a difference uh, yes, as I told you before, uh, that the people here in Egypt still uh, using the same uh, pottery storage uh, uh, in their life. Uh, we called it uh, ballas, uh, something like uh, looks like the amphora, and uh, we still use uh, also uh, these animals like camels, donkeys, uh, but uh, not in all over Egypt. Only in south of Egypt and in farms, uh, and they still uh, using the same shape of this pottery storage uh, in their life. Okay, so the camel was probably just like, oh, it's another day, <laughs> nothing special. <laughs> yeah, that's why I I, I went to another government. Uh, I actually I live in Alexandria. I went to uh, Qena because uh, they uh, there they still have uh, the same uh, old life uh, still uh, still using the same technique in everything and i uh, started my experimentation with uh, an ethnographic study uh, to know more about that society and how they still uh, using the old uh, technique in everything okay great perfect uh, so also, uh, will will there be, uh, as a follow-up to this question, there was, will there be more experiments done with different animals, or do you think that camels would have been the principal animal used in the past? Uh, actually, I uh, I like to uh, to to do more experimentation with uh, with the animals, uh, but here in Egypt we used only camels, uh, donkeys, and sometimes oxes. Uh, to push and pull uh, uh, the big parts of rocks. So there's uh, only a few options, really. Yeah, I think. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Buzz. Thank you. Uh, so uh, another question for Fergus. How many uh, different people uh, did you consult or do you generally consult about the best way to build the roofs? Um, what kind of experiences did they have? I've quite deliberately, actually, with this, not done too much digging into other research people have done. I wanted to come at this fresh um, and just try out some of the materials first. 
and then compare it to other people's experience. I'm um, going back to something Trevor said a few minutes ago, talking about the amount of land you'd need to grow um, thatch for a roof. Uh, I'm aware, for example, that um, there have been experiments done with using spelt straw for thatch, which have been pretty successful. But I didn't want to contaminate my thinking by, you know, reviewing all these previous experiments. I just wanted to try out some materials over a period of time and then see what other people's experience with them was. Does that sort of yeah. answer the question? No, that sounds, yeah, it's a, a good approach, I think, an interesting approach, uh, rather than, yeah, being too overly influenced, perhaps, by, uh, by other things. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, two more questions. Last one for Trevor. Uh, do you already have insights from the social prescribing project or know of any other similar projects that have been successful? Um, I do. There was a, um, a project called Human Henge, and it was conducted out of the University of Bournemouth by, um, I think it was led um, from the University of Bournemouth, which was a collaboration um, between the archaeology department and the, uh, the health department or the the health sciences department of the university, as well as involving uh, some other some other uh, outside um, organisations, and it um, involved uh, engaging with a group of long term um, mental health uh, sufferers, um, in uh, engaging them in the landscape, well, archaeological landscapes, specifically at Stonehenge and at Avebury, and. Um, what they did was was used a sort of um, art based and um, uh, performance based sort of interventions in the landscape or engagements with the landscape, um, and they found anecdotally significant um, benefits to people's sense of of well being. So uh, I think the the premise is that archaeology is in Britain anyway relatively non-political although we can debate that but but in terms that they were engaging non-political it was non-current it it doesn't have the stresses uh, associated with day-to-day -day life so they found a as i say anecdotally a significant enhancement to people's uh, sense of well-being and that was an inspiration for me um i um that was really the uh, you know the sort of wellspring for doing this now um that project can be accessed there's a publication um, that can be accessed online, and if you if you just type in uh, Human Henge Project, um, you should be able to find it as a as a free PDF download. It's, it's really worth reading. Um, they didn't um, they didn't get a huge amount of uh, data, if you like, hard data from the from the process. So. Um, what we're going to be doing on this project is we, we're engaging a, a specialist who will use um, some metrics which have been developed precisely to study um, well-being uh, across time using activities. So we're going to, to actually um, be able to gather data on it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing more about it. <laughs> so the last question uh, is for Linda. It's a two-part one. So you have a lot of experience with uh, obviously experimental archaeology centers. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit? So uh, for those who are wondering, maybe do all centers usually have the same form of experimentation? Are there specialized ones? And also as a second sort of part to that, uh, what advice would you give to students or professionals um, who wish to conduct an experimental archaeology project in countries or at institutions which perhaps do not have such a strong experience or are not as keen to continue in experimental archaeology? Wow, that, that's, that's two really quite huge, um, really interesting questions. And what a note to finish on. So in terms of the centres, I've worked a lot with different archaeological open air museums, and in fact, one of the things that I know Roland had to do first when he was tackling his PhD was just come up with a term for them. And whilst that term archaeological open air museum is now accepted, there are farms, there are centres, there are heritage interpretation centres, there are parks. Some combine working with archaeology with an ecological perspective, uh, like the Steinzeit Park in Dichmarschen, um, in Germany that we worked with. Um, some are very much education orientated, uh, like um, the Poco um, in Modena, and others are about a place and a time. So 
although butter, you know, obviously it's grown so much, but it started off as an Iron Age, but it now does so much more. Valsenalides, the archaeo park there, is very much centred on Utsi and that particular find, because that's, if you like, how they were set up. So the models for all of these different centres are incredibly varied. And some actually close during the summer because they're orientated towards the school year and others, it's completely the reverse. And if they shut at all, it's during the poorer weather season of the winter. And um, many have a mixed sort of mosaic of approaches and all of those offer different opportunities for experiments. I've, I've never met anybody from any of those centers who was not interested in experimentation in the broadest sense. Um, some would like more opportunities to publish, but obviously if their main job is education and interpretation, then, then that's where their focus is. But the way in which Exarch in particular has been opening up opportunities to publish on these sorts of topics so that people can learn from each other. And the world of the internet is both a minefield out there, but it's also got these absolute treasures, repositories of information. And, you know, Exarch certainly acts as a channel for all of those. And each one of the speakers is also a resource in themselves. And there's a, a couple of ones where I'm going to go and I'm going to look for their websites and find out more because I know it will be there. So it's a treasure trove and, and one size does not fit all. And that is just brilliant. It's a mosaic of different opportunities and places. What that means for the second question, which was really what advice would you give for people who are not perhaps in places which do a lot of experimental archaeology, is squeeze it in where you can, because I, I really think that it's a way of engaging with practical primary data generation and all kinds of resources, centres, academic or educational, love the fact that you are engaging directly with material and generating original ideas, original um, prospects for them. And I really think that there will be ways. Um, what I think gets in the way of that sometimes is something that I feel like I've been fighting against for my entire archaeological career, which is the privileging of academic knowledge over if you like, the, the craft knowledge that so often comes into it, or the hands knowledge. And so one of the things that I think experimental archaeology can really help do is give a more, what's the word, a greater precedence and an increased importance for the role of physical hands-on crafts and craft learning and engagement by doing as much as with your head, because you don't leave your head behind when you use your hands, you really don't. And I think putting the two together are exactly where students working all over can really make a difference. So go for it. Thank you so much, Linda. I think that's a lovely place to, to end. 